Right. All right, so um, thank you for choosing our panel, our session. So this is, uh, is going to be a fun one. Uh, my name is uh, Sharon Khan, and I'll be uh, moderating the panel for the first time ever, so bear with me. Um, I just wanted to check so we know who we're talking with. How many entrepreneurs are in the room? Teachers. Um, people that are looking for the next job. Good. You're in the right place. All right. We're going to do a quick introduction, and we're going to leave it to, um, I'm going to ask some questions, but um, hopefully uh, you can also interact and we'll keep it really, uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask questions, and please, when I ask you a question, a short introduction about you and the company, not too long. Um, so I'll shoot first. I'm Sharon Khan, entrepreneur in residence uh, at Babson. We have four companies. The last one uh, in the education spe space sold it to Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble sold it to Pearson. Um, so that's the story for me. So I want to start with a question. Uh, and the first question is um, that I want to know, is, um, is ethic really a good industry for employees? I mean, is it, is it really the best industry to climb the ladder if I want to develop a career? <laughs> Who wants to pick the first one? Go. I, I think it's a, a great... Why don't you just introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Alex Grodd. I'm the founder of Better Lesson. It's a curriculum sharing company. We help teachers connect and share high-quality lessons. Um, I think, in one respect, it's a great... It's the best industry because it's sort of like the Wild West. There's so much opportunity here, so you can, you know, get in on the ground floor of a, a company and you have an opportunity to build, like, the next transformative thing in education. So I think in terms of, like, you know, the ability to really uh, do something on a big scale, I think this is the best, you know, sort of market in the world right now. On the other hand, um, there's very few successful Ed tech companies, very few successful ed tech startups. So if you're, you know, value job security and benefits and, you know, sort of stable quality of life, I think that's probably, you know, it's probably not your industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I might sure I can answer that because we're really not an ed tech company. Okay. Although we started out in, in ed tech, we've migrated to serving consumers. We still serve a lot of, about 25 or 30 percent of our customers are, are teachers and schools and classrooms and preschools, so we have a significant interest. So let me back up. Beth Marcus, CEO of Cleverific, uh, serial entrepreneur. I've, sold, I've been involved in five startups as a founder and about 20 as an advisor and investor. So my first one was sold to Microsoft in 1996. Uh, it's the Sidewinder joystick with the force feedback in it. Oh, I love that one. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, I was also an advisor and investor in LeapFrog pre-IPO. Uh, so I've been in and around the space. Um, Clarific was founded in 2010. And what we're doing now is essentially media aggregation and broadcast on mobile and on the web for all kinds of purposes, for brands, for digital engagement, for end users, etc. So if you have it, Unlike these guys, we get it from everywhere. We mix in educational stuff that comes with teachers so kids can stumble on something fun and educational, and then maybe they want to engage more fully either at home or in the classroom. And the answer to your question is, um, well, it wasn't good for our company to be an ed tech company because we wouldn't have survived this long if we hadn't branched out and served people who can write bigger checks quicker. Um, but if you have good backers or good grants, it's a great place. And in terms of the value of your life, I mean, creating technology that can enhance kids' abilities to succeed in the world and enhance teachers' ability to teach is a great thing, which is why we still put a lot of resources into the ed tech side of it, even though that's not paying the rent. So there's a stigma on ed tech companies that, that's, uh, that you're trying to get out of? Well, in the Boston area, getting funded as an ed tech company purely without the grants, without the proof points, is almost impossible. Well, I think Aaron will disagree. <laughs> well, let's. Yeah. Aaron, yeah. Do you want to? 
if you don't mind, but no, yeah. that so, uh, make it interesting, right? Aaron, Aaron White, co founder and CTO of Boundless Learning, uh, not just Boundless, but it's just for an awesome domain. Um, you know, our, to kind of bring it back to the original question in a second, but our, our, what we do is we uh, make textbooks free for college students. So, you know, you, you think to yourself, uh, if I type something in, I can probably learn it somewhere online. So, why are students paying $1,000 per year for textbook? Or $1,000 per year for all their textbooks? It doesn't really make any sense. So what we do is we go out there and we aggregate high quality open educational content and we create alternative sort of CVS generic drug equivalent textbooks that students can use instead of buying their assigned textbook. So when teachers just read chapter five and whatever they've been assigned, they can learn the same material from us and then ultimately pass their course. Um, so we we went out and you know we actually did uh, my co-founder Ariel and I did some proof points around, you know, is this content out there? Can you assemble it cheaply? Will students believe that they could use this? Can they actually use this to pass their classes? Um, we did maybe you know four or five months of research around this, so there's a little bit more planning ahead of that. And this wasn't you know sort of a full time endeavor, and finally built up comfort uh, at the beginning of uh, 20, uh, 2011, going you know yes, this is possible. We got really excited, so we went out and we raised a two million dollar seed round on you know the learnings that we had in the PowerPoint deck. And this was, and admittedly, this is, you know, we're probably very much an outlier. Uh, so, so on a PowerPoint. Background. On a PowerPoint. On a PowerPoint, you raised two million. And research, but yeah, it was research. PowerPoint. So you worked, how, 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 how long did you work before you raised on the PowerPoint? Um, you know, for myself, it was probably only three months. And for Ariel, it was probably, you know, five or six months from that. And then you raised another? And then six months after that, so we had cash in the bank April 1st. We sprinted to create... Uh, Textbooks across three subject areas, econ, mm -hmm. psychology, and biology, a good spread. Um, we launched that same fall, so August, four months, we built the back end, we built the front end, we built all the content. We launched, got in the hands of students at thousands of colleges. Uh, and then that same, late that fall, we now raised our uh, A round, which was another $8 million. And do you admit that you are at the company? Yeah, so it's interesting. So we, we're, so we straddle it, right? So this is, this is the interesting point. So, you know, Externally, I think we very much look like an ed tech company because uh -huh. we have technology and we're helping education, right? right. And we're providing educational content. Uh, the s slight distinction for us is that what we do is we do sort of an end run around the entire education system straight to the student. Uh -huh. So ultimately, when, a, when someone chooses to adopt our textbook, it's a student doing that, right? And usually it's because of accessibility reasons, both on a, a, a cost accessibility and on a, you know, sort of digital, you know, non-physical accessibility. Right. Um, and so, you know, in some sense, you can classify students as consumers. Uh, it's coming right out of their mind, their pocket. But, you know, at, at the same time, it, it, we're sort of in that educational space. And we do work with professors to create alternative textbooks uh, custom to their classes as well. Right. It's very this interesting because really they, 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 they sound like they're a little bit of uh, um, on a defensive mode, don't you think? No, I think it, it's a really important distinction. Yeah. Because in the U.S. anyway, it's different overseas. So if you start your product overseas, you can get faster adoption in education. Right. But in the U.S., the idea of going through school systems or districts has a hugely long sales cycle. That's right. And if you're not lucky enough to raise a $2 million seed, you might not survive that sales cycle to your first sale. And the other thing these guys said is you need proof points which I said, you need your proof points, and what are your resumes like beforehand of the founders? So proof points on the technology, but also proof points on how business savvy the founders are will get you the fine. Right. So just to, you know, I... Well, let, me, let me just okay. jump to the next one, because we want to okay. open the conversation. <laughs> uh, so Megan, what, I want to know what really works in uh, recruiting. Is it more or less the same? Do I just send my resume and hopefully somebody will turn my call? Are there more effective ways to recruit talent into this industry so those guys will be very proud that they're part of the EdTech community? Sure. So let me give you a background on my company. We are a strategic headhunter for education technology companies, and our focus even within that market is in sales team expansion and leadership acquisition. So for an example, when smart technologies tried to expand into the United States, out of Canada, we built out their entire team, 32 people, all the way from upper level leadership down to individual contributors. We put in place the hiring strategy, the compensation packages, and we really executed a strategy that wouldn't overwhelm the company so that they couldn't take that team and bring themselves to the next level in the US market. 
So from a recruiting standpoint, we work for our clients exclusively. We don't work for candidates. We don't send candidates over to our clients. That's not something we do. The resume is certainly important. You can see a lot of great things in candidates from that. From our standpoint, we receive 400, 500 resumes every day. So how do you distinguish yourself on a resume? Well, we take a look at the red flags first. You don't have your contact information on top. You're avoiding putting your location there. Well, then you might be opportunistically looking for a new role, and then you're not really looking for the best role. You're not looking to be a part of an organization to grow. Um, another example. If you don't take the time in formatting your resume, how are you going to take the time to format a response for a proposal? You're just not going to. You won't be included in our process. So that's one little part. In terms of the best recruiting techniques, the first thing is that you have to understand your business goals prior to going out and recruiting for any position. Then you need to understand how your new hire is going to impact those goals. And then you need to create an interview plan that asks appropriate questions that are based on those goals, starting with chronological interviews, then behavioral-based interviews on past performance. The past performance of the candidate has to exactly match what you are going to want for that candidate in their new role. If they haven't done that for you, they're not the right hire. You need to spend the time with the candidates, really understanding their competencies, their personality. And for every candidate that's going out there, we're going to request that they do a 30, 60, 90 day plan to that company to make sure that they're appropriately helping them meet their goals. So I want to stay on the resume, because I um, sometimes I think that a uh, resume doesn't really show uh, everything. And mm -hmm. I still think that uh, the industry really considers so you know, the resume as the first screening process. Do you guys, do you have any other more effective tools to understand what you're dealing with? I am. Uh, I think Aaron, Aaron would probably or can speak to this, but I think with hiring software engineers, your resume is, is, doesn't matter very much at all. I think it's, it's mostly, you know, what you've built, what projects you've worked on. I mean, you have a body, you have your own sort of body of work that I think is, is most effective. Certainly a resume is in like where you went to college, what degrees you have, the prestige of, of those things. Just when hiring software engineers, is, which over the past four years, that's mostly what I've hired. Um, I think it's probably pretty similar boundless. Um, traditional resumes mean very little. I think when uh, hiring other jobs, um, and particularly, you know, sort of management level jobs and, and uh, <coughs> business development jobs, I think I, I you know, I still um, spend, use resumes to sort of narrow down the initial pool, but I, you know, I think it's, I think the world is tilting towards uh, a place where your, your body of work um, with the internet can become, you know, start to become your resume, and it's less sort of, you know, you know, your reputation is more about your body of work and less about like various uh, institutions you affiliate with. Aaron, how do you recognize a talented person? Yeah, so so I'll probably echo a few things yeah. and that a little bit. So you know, if we get well, so first is through your network, right? So I mean, we've yeah. done a lot of hiring through you know close friends and friends in the network uh, <laughs> who we know and trust you know, and we've seen what they've done. But beyond that, if we get sort of cold contact, you know, we're putting feelers out there through a variety of different different ways. Um, you know, we'll get a resume and I'll look at it and I'll, I'll, I'll do the sniff test first, right? There are some like obvious things that if I don't see them, uh, you know, it's just delete the email, it's gone. Um, but beyond that, the very next thing I do is I Google the person. Yeah. And if I can't find their body of work online, so, you know, and again, for us, we kind of straddle that line, we do some consumer stuff, we hire a lot of software engineers who we expect to be building, you know, software that's facing, you know, ultimately millions of students. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can't find them online, I don't trust that they know how to build for the online world. Yeah. Um, and so that's an instant instant pass from us on the software engineering side of things. So that so online go Google yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And you should be able to rank highly for your name plus location, right? Like, uh -huh. if you're not, you know, name along, but it should work out. Okay. So I want to emphasize the personal referral is more important than anything else. Because there are, I hire engineers and management and everything else, but uh, we're currently hiring engineers, so that's in the front of my mind. Um, the idea that somebody knew you, knew what you did, and is willing to refer you through LinkedIn or somewhere else, 
is really important. Because a lot of engineers, let's face it, I mean, I went to this place. We're not great at, at promoting. And so if, if you put that one paragraph in the email that's going and you say, you know, this is what I want to do. This is why I'm good at it. Here's two or three things you can find on the internet. Yep. That one paragraph is much more valuable because the CEOs or the hiring managers who are hiring you don't have time to That's wade right. through your stuff and figure it out. So there might be good candidates in a pile of stuff you get that get totally overlooked because they can't even write a good intro paragraph or they can't find somebody in their connected world to push their resume across or their, their connection. I would say, yeah. I mean, starting with your network, that's you know, all, all the people we've hired, the, the ones that have been the best team members have tended to come from friends of friends or people within our network. I think the other way in which I've had some success recruiting people is just um, through events like these. So it's not out of someone in your network, but you're out actively networking, and so then it's sort of, you know, they become part of your network. I mean, I. I'm not technical, so I get asked a lot from people in ed tech and entrepreneur, you know, how do you find your technical co-founder? And I always say just, you know, I spent six months at every single Boston tech event in 2009. You know, literally went to, I was the least technical person in, in the room for like six straight months. And, you know, eventually I found my, my soulmate and it's, it's, been a, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great ride. But it, a lot of it is just, you know, you try to leverage your network and then you just got to hustle. And it's hard. You know, it's really, it's hard and it's time consuming and it can be awful because you can put in so much time and have nothing to, uh, you don't have, you know, nothing in terms of the hire. You have, you've built your network, you've learned, but uh, that's that's the other way to do it, especially early on when you're really just trying to, you know, start a company. I think that's... It, it, and on the, on the topic of technical co-founders being kind of on the other end, right. You know, one one thing for me. So, you know, Ariel, uh, uh, who's my co-founder, Ballas, who you know, it's really kind of stemmed from him, and you know, got caught up in the, the whirlwind. It's been fantastic. But you know, my first my first instinct when I meet a business person is like, oh, come on, right? Because it's <laughs> like, I don't know what you do. Like, you, you're in a spreadsheet all day. I don't know what that means. So he actually he had he is one of those you know very clear about like here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and do it, and like here's what I've done. I'm going to go do these things. Now they happen, and you're just like blown away by, by this. And he networked extremely aggressively, right. very similarly. So, you know, being good at communicating what it is your value That's is, good. don't expect people to get caught up in your idea. I didn't even think this thing would work the first, you know, three months I was exposed to it. It's like, come on, like, I'll help you with some of that, but it's not going to happen. So that's important. How many people do you have in the room that are not developers? Okay, so you didn't answer the question. <laughs> no, we don't care about developers. How do you recruit people? To other jobs, other than developers. Same way. I mean, I can tell two quick stories about how I got senior man senior management people in my company. Yeah. And by going out and networking, just like you said, um, I was having trouble finding somebody for marketing who knew how to reach consumers. In the Boston area, it's kind of tough, right? And so I told everybody I knew, and I went to the birthday party of Laura Fitton, the yeah. CEO of yeah. uh, 140, because she's a very connected person. And I got there early because I have a kid. And I was talking to another CEO, this woman, Farnes. And she said, oh, you know, I know this guy who's a Carbonite. And they just went public. And he's kind of bored. And he built their traffic. Um, let me introduce you. And so well, about what if I'm not in your network? How do I get your attention? Are you using recruiters? Can I, uh, can I uh, contact you through LinkedIn? I mean, what, how do we get on your radar if we don't? We're not in the network. Well, let me, I guess, explain to you my process and how our recruiters work. So we have a research team on staff. Their sole goal is to find profiles that match the goals of our clients. And they will spend all day, every day, building a big pile of profiles for our recruiters. They're looking at all the social media sites. They are looking at target competitors, because if you're pulling a salesperson who has a great list of contacts from a competitor, they can automatically take those contacts and use them to sell for your product. Um, once we've developed all of those potential candidates, they're hidden candidates. They're not going to be in our clients' market, because if they were, they might be working for them. They should be working for them if they're that great. Um, if you don't know them, we're going to go out and find and hunt that person for you through social media, through our network, through calling up potential candidates and saying, okay, you don't know this person, you're not the right person, but who else do you know? And it takes time, and many of our clients 
you know, six months down the line, they haven't hired the right salesperson, they've lost their revenue, they've lost their pipeline, and they've lost time because they're spending the time searching rather than doing their job. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's definitely you know the hand-to-hand -hand combat of conferences, networking. You gotta that's got to be a foundation. But then I think there's a lot of creativity using. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So we just hired someone who contacted us cold uh, via LinkedIn, contacted our board member um, via LinkedIn, and you know was had a really awesome position in London. Was moving to Boston, had heard of our company, and um, just you know sort of reached out pretty randomly, and it, and it worked. So I think to Aaron's point earlier, you know, building an online presence for yourself um, is is critical sort of annoying term, online presence, but, um, you know, being on Twitter, being active on Twitter, active on um, LinkedIn, I, you know, contacting me or Aaron or someone via a tweet, like a clever tweet or something, it's worth, okay. like, yeah, yeah, it works really well. It's so much better than, like, cold email and, and stuff like that. It's really, you know, we've hired, I hired someone that I just had a, a little mini Twitter fling with, and um, <laughs> he was awesome. Uh, even even the, 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 the cold emails can work, too. So just one, one story that I've seen scale up, but, but it's about an intern work we have right now in marketing. Yeah. Um, marketing, semi-technical, but you know, I'm trying to go not dev here. But uh, he wrote in uh, when he saw uh, news about our, our A round. And he said, hey, look, I've got this, this textbook uh, trading site that I built you know, for, for my college, and I've been trying to get the word out to students, and here's what I've learned about yeah. getting the message out. I wanted to share it with you guys. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And then we just kind of kept in touch with them. He kept sending me, sending me helpful info over like a couple of months. of like, hey, you guys should try this, or I saw this work, or do you consider this, or by the way, you've got a bug in your blog over here, yeah. yada, yada, yada. And after you know, six months, I'm like, why don't you just start working for us now? Because this is awesome. The personal, yeah, yeah being things. really personal, like yeah. form... Intro letters don't you know don't really work, but really like yeah, you know, showing that you've invested time in understanding and understanding that you understand the company yeah. and what they're doing. And people not like hey, I uh, heard about you're cool. How can I help you? Yeah, uh, I don't know. You know, you tell me. Let's get the audience involved a little bit. I know I'm breaking the rules, but well, well Alex, you're about to make a point about your Twitter, the Twitter connection. Was there something? Oh specific? yeah, the, the, the fling, but it it was. Um, yeah, I just think Twitter, I, I'm not as active as I, I was, uh, you know, like, for a while, but I think Twitter's a really nice way where you can access a lot of people, or people, like, just sort of have different boundaries because it's sort of fun and playful, and so I think, like, building up a Twitter reputation, building up, like, followers and having, like, a real Twitter presence allows you to access people that would be very difficult to access in other means. I think, you know, LinkedIn, like really using LinkedIn, like asking for introductions and, and things like that and building up, a, you know, LinkedIn network's really helpful. Um, yeah, Facebook as well, you know, Facebook as well. Just, um, I think Aaron's point is huge. The more, like, really, uh, the more you can display that you're really invested in the company and the people in the company and that it's not just a, you know, you're not just doing the same thing to 20 other companies is really important. Question there, yes. Uh, we're on CEO of Testive. I'm actually proud. We are recruiting right now for a non-engineer position, which is very exciting. Good. We're a little <laughs> for engineers. Um, and for you guys, I'm curious about sort of how you factor in sort of mission or you know importance of education. So I think one of the interesting things about the space is often a lot of the businesses are very mission driven. If you're really orienting a for-profit business, but you know we're all here to care about education. How important is that for you? Is it like must they must they care about education? Must that be a passionate focus? Um, how do you weigh that? I'm going to jump in. Um, because I think what I was missing in the answers here is that for somebody that built four companies in the past, very important for uh, having a mission, that you really align with what the company does. Um, it's not just about skill set. It's also about culture. Do you fit the culture? Um, are you going to stay around when time are going to get worse? And it's going to go worse, right? So you have to be aligned with understanding that you're in the education space. And I think it's the bumpy road. And I think that's very important. So certainly, like, obviously fitting with the culture. But you can imagine someone who fits with the culture and the people of your organization. is like, hey, I love this group of people. Um, or I love the particular product that you're making. 
I'm talking about like you know. Sort of like, well, I'm not sure if education is my passion, oh, but, but but let's assume that they're a good cultural fit and things like that. I, I, I think most people like it's pretty low bar to be passionate about education. Right? <laughs> I think, like, there's not too many people you'll find that be like, you know, I'm not into Just like having good schools for my children. Right? So, <laughs> I think uh, I think that it's it's first off being a mission oriented company is the biggest competitive advantage that we all have when recruiting engineers and, and sort of hard hard to find jobs, you know, if they're choosing between like some mobile ad platform or, you know, transforming the teaching profession, like it's a pretty easy, you know, um, choice if it's sort of the, the offer is, is similar. Um, and I think it's, yeah, so it is, it is a pretty low bar. I think um, certainly having people that really um, Believe in both bottom lines. If you're, you know, if you really are a, a double bottom line company and are trying to aggressively pursue a social mission and build a great company, I think that's like, and that's just about you know building a, a culture <coughs> around that, building your company culture that is where sort of both bottom lines are part of the conversation and part of the sort of daily dialogue. Ben, if you have people who have come in that look interesting, and you got two people. And one of them has been in educational technology forever, and one has not. I would encourage you to find connection points. I mean, like for us, it's having kids. Uh, our CTO doesn't have kids in our age group, but his wife is an educator. And so they have some connection point to the world that you're living in. So don't be so strictly you know, structured about check off this box, check off this box. Get to know if that person has been incredibly successful marketing or selling or <coughs> developing something and they don't exactly have the Rolodex you want but they're aggressive and maybe they are willing to work for a little less, I wouldn't throw them out. I would certainly consider them. Particularly the earlier stage you're at in your company. Yeah. Coming from a sales perspective, if you're hiring for a sales role, if you're selling something transactionally, there's not so much consultation. It may not matter that they're not the superstar, the one that's really, really invested in education. But if you're selling something where your salesperson is going and spending a lot of time with educators, that passion is going to have to come through to separate that salesperson from the next person coming through their door. So from our perspective, it's why we only recruit for education, and it's why we can pinpoint if a candidate's really interested in the space or if they want to make money, they may not be the same thing, and we'll apply that to every search. Um, many of our clients don't care, but the ones that do, there's, those are the ones that are changing the shape of education. Yes. Um, this question may be uncomfortable, but I'm wondering, I didn't hear any of the three entrepreneurs say they use a recruiter. And I'm hearing from the recruiter how great it is to use a recruiter. So I'm wondering, have you ever engaged the services of a recruiter? And if so, why not? And is that a sort of an early stage, something you can't afford to do versus a later yeah. stage? So, so for early stage, it's, it's yeah, we have got money too, so it's hard to say. We we use recruiters, okay, um, and we've we've made uh, we have one of our best team members came through a recruiter. I think you know, kind of echoing back to, to the last question, having a, a, a strong mission. You know, we want to make textbooks free. We want to take down the establishment. And, you know, go big and make education affordable. Like that's a hugely attractive. So we get a lot of inbound, which is a great advantage of being in a space where everybody can get excited about it. Um, we don't require that people be excited about that, but it does make us a big magnet. You know, so when we hire people, we look for that good cultural fit to get through that trough of sorrow. Um, we look through, you know, we look for people who can be excited about working on a particular product and work with the team. Um, but yeah, we've absolutely used recruiters, and we've gotten some, you know, again, some quiet engineers out of it who are phenomenally, you know, methodical and smart, and and one of the funniest guys in the organization. He's just not very social, so I would never have met him at any of the networking events that, that I kind of aggressively pursue. Okay. So I would suggest, even in the early stages of a startup, you should get to know recruiters who have value for you. Because if you're going to be successful, they're going to want to recruit for you later. And I've had experience in my five startups getting to know a recruiter who's of value. And they'll do it on a commission basis only, not a retainer, for a startup that they really like. I've even had some people, which I didn't end up doing, offer to take stock in an early uh, position in order to get you started to being a successful business. So don't write them off just because you can't afford the retainer or the fee is 30% of the salary. Right. They're in, the, in this marketplace, it's negotiable. 
Everything is negotiable. Uh, I love the support. That was not the answer that I expected. That is my biggest <laughs> objection every day is why should I pay you to go do something or a chart of right should do. That being said, I can tell you that as of right now, I have a you know, ton of startup companies that I'm working with. We've been willing to come down on the first search because our goal is to partner with our clients over the long term, see them grow, see them become a success in the space. Yeah. And as a CEO, you can't be good at everything. No. You know, and HR is the hardest thing. 50% of all people you hire in most startups, <coughs> you're going to fire. And so if your investors want you to be successful, they want you to de-risk those hires more than anything else. Right. I'll tell you what we're missing in the recruiting industry is I think that, as Megan mentioned, that they usually represent the company, right? Imagine that they would represent us as, you know, potential employees, why, where it could be such an asset. But they usually get retained by the company. And, uh, you know, that's that's the missing piece, I think, in the recruiting. I thought that was that's true. That. Go ahead. So we work yeah. at a completely different model than most recruiting companies. We're an engaged search firm. So part of our fees are up front to have us engage with you, the restaurant, the back end. But every candidate we're putting through our process we're making sure that they understand the expectations of the new role. We're making sure that they're okay with the salary level that going in. And if they're not the right fit, we're keeping in constant contact with these people to make sure that if another opportunity comes around, they're the right person that right. we're going to reach out to them. The other thing that we offer is we offer completely separate to our recruiting um, candidate training. So any candidate can come to us and enroll in our candidate training. They're going to get webinars. They're going to get resume help. We'll help them rewrite their resume. We're not going to pitch them to our client at the end of that, but we're going to help them really uh, go through a search process for their own jobs. Yes? Can you guys talk a little bit about just hiring uh, and getting on board people who are not in engineering? So if, if, if you're subject matter experts, curriculum designers, instructional folks, potential teachers to come on to your team as well. Um, I've had a hard time finding a right outlet to reach out to them um, and get them on board. And then on the other side is a resume obviously is not good enough to be able to judge their work. So what do you look for if you're hiring subject matter experts and curriculum designers? Uh, we just hired a, a bunch. We got a um, grant from the Gates Foundation right. to work with teachers. And um, and so we needed to, like, within a period of three weeks, hire two people to sort of run the grant, manage the relationships with teachers, and they needed to have really strong instructional backgrounds. And um, yeah, one and so one of them was just straight through network. Our my co-founder Aaron had a friend that was on a rowing team with this rower that had taught for three years, and 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 so it just you know there's. There's just that's, some, that's cyclical, right? Because teachers can't leave in the middle of October and say, "I'm going to go join this company and leave the school." You know, so, yeah, so, she, so she was not. She was not. She had taught for three years. Okay. I was a rowing coach, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, no. If, if you're looking to hire teachers, but you do not want to like rip a teacher right. from a uh, <laughs> classroom. That's, that's bad karma. Um, so, um, you know, like for me, the Teach for America, I, so I did Teach for America, so the, the Teach for ne America network has just been awesome. And, and that's, you, you know, um, and I, so I don't know what it's like to engage with, like, you know, the TFA network if you're not an alum, but as an alum, it's been, you know, it's been huge and we've hired some TFA alums and also just been put in touch uh, with others. And then the other, uh, the other candidate, we just, job posting, like, you shouldn't underestimate, like, a job posting. Like, we post it to Idealist, I think, which is sort of like, you know, uh, social mission-oriented jobs. And we got, you know, we got a bunch of great candidates, and one of them was just, she was awesome. And it was like, within the matter of, yeah, it was under a month, we just had the two of them, and they were, you know, vibing, and there was good chemistry in it, and it had been great. Um, so, you know, I think, again, net, like, figure out network, and then, you know, like, job postings do work. You can, you got to, like, wade through a lot of muck, but it's, uh, it's they do work. You can post to ISTE and also South by Southwest as well. So when you know there's an event going on where a lot of educators are going to go, mm -hmm. uh, tweeting, but also finding that if they have programs for posting jobs, for the non-technical, that's a great way that we've found to find people who are interested. So we have a content arm of Boundless, too, for different right. subject matter experts. And, you know, job postings for sure, LinkedIn, I mean, that one's a little bit different. Uh, 
you know, but on the subject of, of how to get people kind of on the off cycle, right? So one thing we do is we have a, a you know kind of an army of, of, of freelancers on the con, so we have kind of like elastic content and capability, um, and so you can get you know people who are otherwise employed or teaching to kind of work with your company and support the mission, and then we hire out of that pool into full time. And so teachers don't get paid a lot, and we found that there are all kinds of teachers who want evening and weekend work. And right. if your company is willing to be flexible yeah. about how you engage with somebody, and then you can bring them in so, over time. Yeah, it's a good investment. So, like one of our our, our new uh, science subject matter expert was doing, you know, a few hours a week part time with us, and it was just the highest quality. She wrote the highest, you know, most valuable insights. She sent it back, and she's like, "Why don't you come work with us?" And it just happened to work out. Um, and then, you know, it's, that works actually. In, in, it's not that's not a unique strategy to the, the right. content or teaching side, you know. Yeah. Our, we have campus reps in various campuses, and this one girl at Florida State University was just, you know, blowing it out of the water. She just did such a great job of, of getting the word out and getting the students kind of excited and, and, and successfully using balance. We're like, she graduated. We're like, what are you doing? Why don't you come work with this? So that it, it works kind of across okay. across functions. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm running a company that's based in Ithaca, New York, and so we're in the middle of nowhere. And there, I, you don't have to speak to that, but it's Maybe I'll come to you afterwards and ask if you, if you have any advice about that. But we are located next to Cornell, and um, and Bo you know Boston, of course, has lots of great schools to recruit from too. Do you have any advice about how to recruit from colleges? And you know, ed tech companies have less money than non ed tech companies to pay employees, and so college students can be like a good potential recruiting source. Um, and then also. Like a related question is, if you can't pay them a full salary, you can also pay them in equity or, or give equity compensation. And how do you decide how much equity to give? And do you have any sort of advice about that? Um, well, you want to go I mean, the, the latter, you know, how do you um, think about equity with founding teams? It's like, you that's know, we could talk, yeah, that's, talk that's a whole conference. Yeah, and that's what kind of it's <laughs> talking about. You know, you're you're an established company, you're trying to hire like a new engineer, you can't pay a full salary, so you give you established know. if you're an established I mean it all depends where what stage the company is at, um, you know, how many how much how many more rounds of evolution there'll be. You know, it's hard to answer that without you know, a few more data points. Um, I think but you know, we've we hired a, a college student uh, recently. Um, it's great. You gotta, you know, it's sort of the trade-off between between needing to invest some real time and bringing them up to speed and, and sort of, um, and you know, but you get it's really affordable and you get you know someone really scrappy and someone that wants to um, just wants to learn and it was it was really great energy for us. Um, so and I, and you know in general the one thing that we have and and. That no, you know, that not all startups have is this. You know, that you're trying to change the world, and I wouldn't discount how that, like the impact that can have when, as a competitive advantage when recruiting. Um, I think that's that's been huge for us. Okay. So I've spoke. I've guest lectured at Cornell. You're close. You can go there, find the professors of the subjects that you might want to recruit kids out of, and offer your <coughs> services. And when you're in an environment like this talking, kids will come up and you can engage with them before the other guys, if you get them before they go into that formal recruiting process that comes at the end of the year, they'll get excited about you. Maybe they'll work evenings and weekends just like the educators. So, you know, get connected with that university. They probably have an entrepreneurship forum. I don't personally know that they do, but they have all kinds of other conferences there. And they have ed conferences there as well. So I would dive in. And uh, th that's exactly the, the business model that I have, and it works extremely well. What I do is I help to have companies engage and get into classes and be teaching partnership with them. Specifically, I work one of the kind is Warner, Warner Brothers has its largest studio here in New England, right in Needham, and I used to work there. And I bet the majority of you are saying I, I didn't even realize Warner Brothers was in New England. But that's their problem. So a lot of companies have trouble uh, having saturation in schools, brand saturation, or even getting recruiting. Yeah. What I noticed is you get them to start teaching and partnering with the instructors, right. they have first access to the best and the brightest. And of course, the students start putting out work beyond anything because they're just like, wow, here's a potential employer, WB. And if not, then all the other companies that are closely linked to them. So, so I happen to be an ER at Jackson College. And a couple of ways how you can recruit. First of all, all of them now looking for summer jobs. Right? Uh, there's career fairs. 
But if you want some contacts or how to get in front of with Babson uh, or MIT, which I happen to mentor companies there, I'll be happy to uh, give it to you. But I can tell you that students will be uh, thrilled and they're looking to take the um, opportunity. Very excited about EdTech companies. Yeah. This is the one that I see. That really seldom. So we do the, we do internships, co-ops. Yeah. I speak at all the like their little tiny hacker clubs. Like I'll come in and talk to ten students about stuff. Like I love doing that. We hosted networking nights for students at our office, and so we'll get students to come to our office, see the space, hear the mission, and then you know meet each other and learn from us. And that's another great way to engage them. The number one thing we sell them on uh, is actually uh, I mean the mission sort of we always sell everybody on it's given, but it's the opportunity to learn. So I, I, I try to put in their heads, and I, I believe this isn't just a sales pitch to get people you know hooked up with us, but the number one best thing you can do for yourself as a student uh, coming out of college is position yourself to learn aggressively and, and spending your entire 20s doing that. And so I really try to offer up, look, we're at the cutting edge, we're doing all these things, we invest in the students who come in and learn, and yes, it's, it takes some amount of us, but you know, we had this great relationship with a co-op over three years, and like, it paid back incredibly well. I mean, he was... Uh, you know, operating a level of somebody who was, you know, seven years out of college. So, can you comment on how eager the schools are to work with you? Extremely, more? Eager. even more so yeah. than companies. Uh, yes. They do anything to have companies in there teaching Absolutely. with them, yeah. and, then, and, and of course, it works yeah. for companies. And well. Babson is all about entrepreneurship, and yeah. uh, we Babson. definitely really aggressively uh, uh, promote that. Just to complete, because I'm not sure that we answer your question about uh, compensation. So, uh, one thing is to do some credit arrangement with the school. Right, so if it's for credit, they can come and work with you. Uh, there's classes specifically at Babson where kids are placed uh, in work during the semester year. So that's another uh, resource for you. Um, uh, but definitely, you have to figure out how to compensate that. Yeah, at least in this state, that's not legal for free. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't do it fairly, you're in trouble with yeah, the feds. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we have right. no unpaid interns. Yeah. Right. Right. Even if you just pay that's them right. essentially starvation wages to begin with, you know, when you're not sure if there's an intern and you're not really sure how valuable they're going to be, we pay them a little bit of something for three months and we start out the engagement saying, if you make it through the three right. months, here's what your contract will look like at the end of the three months. And if they make it through the pipeline, they should be rewarded. Mm -hmm. One of my soapbox issues for the day is something that I've learned with our interns is that when you don't call them an intern, you call them an associate, they work much harder for you. They feel like they're invested in the team. Wow. That's um, so we don't use that term at our, our agency. Um, and I have to say the interns that we've had now that are now associates are overperforming. It's great. More questions. You're doing a better job than I do. You. Hi. Uh, so I work for uh, a larger firm, um, but I've even seen in our firm this play out. So my question is around um, how much experience the hire needs to have in the education field, particularly in the non-development area. So for instance, we've hired people who were selling into a particular area, let's say enrollment or development, and were previously deans of enrollment or deans of development um, or online learning and mobile learning and had experience in those areas. So what do you find as helpful? Is it helpful to have people who've had previous knowledge in that field or maybe worked in that field? Um, I know for us, we've seen like a three month, the first quarter, it's made a huge difference in terms of pipeline and growth for our sales side. May you do that? I can be, say quick, I, yeah. I bet you'll probably say something similar. When it comes to selling to school districts, so, you know, that's a important job in this, the current ecosystem, sadly. Um, you know, having a, having someone that has experience selling to schools district, school districts, if you're, if you're making a sales hire, versus someone who's done sales in like Tupperware or whatever, it's just, we've, we've experienced it. It's really important to hire people who have sold to school districts before because it's such an idiosyncratic, horrible process. Um, so I think outside of that, um, I'd be, you know, we certainly in engineering, like it's not, it's not necessary by any means. Um, uh, and then I'd say in between those two poles, like generally is, is helpful, but not necessary. Maybe if we had done that, we'd still be a pure ed tech company. We hired interns and teachers in the beginning, and it was an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll even take it one step further. It's one thing to have sold into education. It's another thing to sell to the same decision maker that your company needs to sell to. So they're going to have to have experience selling to that level of person, that type of person, the black book. So I would never tell 
one of my math companies go out and hire a literacy salesperson. It just doesn't make sense. They're not going to have the right contacts. And they're also not going to have the right vocabulary to have that conversation. They're going to have to learn it. And by the time they learn it, you've lost six months of your sales cycle. And if you're a startup, you don't have more than that. You don't have that, exactly. Yes. You all had the luxury of having a round and bringing in talent, them coming to you through Twitter and things like that. When you first raised a seed round and you had very limited funds and, and you didn't have the long-term kind of job security to offer, what do you recommend? I've never you? offered long-term. Yeah. <laughs> but at least your company is established it's to the point where they anyway. three million from Gates that they trust that there's a, a you know some longevity proven there. And when you were first bringing in you know, your yeah, third your third employee or something. I, I how do you bring the confidence with that third employee? You know, you have yourself and your other founder, and you have seed round, and, and any recommendation on bringing that person in and how you give them comfort? So, so size-wise, I think that's just in the stage of getting out of seed. Yeah. So, I mean, I've done it five times. Yeah. And first of all, the myth of security, since the, the late 90s, you know, there is no such thing as security, so you have to disavow people of the myth because they can work for a huge company and, and be on the street tomorrow, first of all. Right. Second of all, you need to understand, if you want somebody, like every time I've hired in this company, I've hired somebody beyond the reach of this company at the stage they were at because they were the right fit. And if they're the right fit, you find a way, you go to your investors if you have any, you sit down with your partners and say, what will incentivize this individual to join us because we need them? And then you let the person convince themselves. If they don't fall in love with you, what you're doing, and the people that they're going to be working for, and believe the potential at that very early stage, then you don't want them. And if you do that job, they will come. And, and then it's your job to figure out, you know, okay, I can do that. If you sit down with them and say, they can do this for three months at no salary for equity, um, then you work with them to make the revenue happen or the funding happen in whatever their window is so that they can be compensated in cash as well. Do you give that period, that kind of test period of that three months, is, you know, to see how the fit works and see if their commitment was there? And I always have a output. cliff of three to six months on equity so that if you, for those of you who don't know the lingo, the idea is you work for the company and depending on where you are, it's either three months or six months. You don't get that equity until you make it through that window, because getting it back is a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I mean, when I first started, I think first, you, you need to target people with the right risk profile. You just have to be honest, right? So like, you know, single parent, five children, and whatever, <laughs> like, you probably want to like, you know, yeah. uh, have quick conversations with them. And then, yeah, everything, so. Well, I don't disagree because, I mean, I had a sales guy who was on unemployment and when he came, and I said, okay, I'll match the unemployment and then you'll be commissioned. And he believed in himself. And I'm a single parent with no a significant backup for all of that. And I hired people who have two kids and one income if they understand it, and that's the honesty piece. Yeah, it's just the risk profile. I, I'm not saying people with children and whatever can't have a high risk profile. I just, I'm saying you need to weed out for risk profile quickly. Um, that's, a, that's a good comment. So how, how much risk do you guys take? So do you, would you, well, but you said, I think you said that you're going to hire people with previous experience that did more or less the same. How much are you going to take chance on people that are now transitioning into the industry? They're not in their 20s. Um, how, much, um, how much are you going to bet on this person that they can learn and understand and be successful? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I mean, we, we've definitely... It's interesting. So you the question earlier about hiring people out of ed tech too. Yeah. Like sometimes it can work against you, right? So we're we're not a publishing company, but we do things that come into a publishing company. So we've actually avoided people with publishing experience because yeah. it pulls us in the wrong direction. So I think it's definitely depends on your company. But uh, yeah, no. So we we people who are just really hungry, who have a risk tolerance, who believe the mission, want to get on board, um, and have something to show for it, either by sending me, you know. Uh, just constant insight, or every time I meet with them, they just drop something on me that just blows me away. Yeah. Or they've had success, you know, doing similar activities, but in a totally different industry. So we just hired a new um, VP of marketing uh, who was in sort of B two B, 
very, very different than, than yeah. what we're doing. We're, we're B to C, right? So, right. Uh, but a lot of the activities were the same, and you know, we just built up comfort over, uh, you know, well, many, many months, right? But, but that's what it took for us. Yeah. More questions? Uh, wait, did you ask a question already? I haven't. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. I actually don't have a question, but I wanted to talk a little bit about risk. Yeah. Uh, 